ready to film. Actually, I'm not gonna be able to repot anything with you standing there though. Okay. Hey guys, welcome back. Introduction, blah, blah, blah. So, today's video is going to be a repot with me slash Q&A all about coffee. And if you're new to this channel or if you don't follow me on Instagram, you might be like, why are we talking about coffee? And that's a really fair question. I mentioned before that I work in specialty coffee um, and I have done for about 15 years now or coming up to 15 years. And a lot of people were asking me to talk a little bit more about what I do. Um, they had questions about coffee. So a couple weeks ago, I put a question box on my stories and asked if there was anything people wanted to know about coffee in general or about what I do. And a bunch of questions came through. So I thought I'd do a little repot with me and answer through those. So I have a few plants I wanted to repot. There's a few plants I want to get on a pole, at least two plants. And because I wanted to kind of explain the poll as I was making it, I'm going to just do that part first before I get into the questions because I'm not going to be able to do both at the same time. So if you're a subscriber of Charmaine's, you will have seen this type of poll before. So um, if you haven't watched her Lazy Moss poll video, I'm going to put a thumbnail right here and I'll also link it in the description. So the Lazy Moss poll has evolved over the last, um, I don't know, five, six months. It started as a extension to an existing moss pole and the existing one was more like a classic moss pole design. She put like a C-shaped backing of mesh on the back of the pole to extend it and make it longer. That was like her lazy uh, extension. And that turned into like a standalone moss pole design. So she was making lazy moss poles, which was like a flat piece of mesh on the back moss plant and then the moss was just tied with velcro and then I got these clear plastic sheets in order to make that moss pole design which was like that half moon moss pole and this binding cover was a suggestion I was reading through this thread on Facebook and people were listing like the materials they use to make moss poles and I don't remember which group this was I think it's one of the American groups and this was one of the suggestions. So I found this on Amazon. I ordered that in and then we shared it amongst ourselves. And then this backing became like the new backing for the lazy moss pole design, which for a little while there was um, the clear backing moss and then Velcro tied around it. And then we wanted to figure out a way to make the fasteners kind of invisible but also at the same time be able to hold in moisture so there was like a couple of ideas um i think jing and charmaine tried velcro dots so like those little circular velcro stickers but the adhesive would always kind of like slide off in the humidity and warmth of the greenhouse so we were brainstorming ways to get the clear pieces of plastic which is the same material as the backing to fasten onto itself in a really easy way. And Jing's idea was to make opposing slits on these slides. So the, the plastic would just kind of like hook onto itself. And it was just such a genius idea. Honestly, I don't see any need for any other type of moss pole in the near future, unless I needed something really strong for like a giant plant, but I think for like 90% of my moss pole, this is going to be the design I go with from now on. Um, it is such a genius moss pole design that like, what, what more could you want? So the thing I love about it is that like, let's say this was like grown to the top of the pole and I wanted to propagate it. All I have to do is take the fasteners off and then separate the moss. I don't have to like cut through all this mesh. I don't have any zip ties to worry about. It's just so simple. And I don't know how I lived without this design for so long. So yeah, I'm going to get a plant onto this pole. And that plant is going to be my Monstera Escaletto. Um, this was propagated from a single leafless node. So it's right there. It's ready for a pole now. It's grown two leaves and the aerial roots are kind of poking out of the bottom here going into the substrate. So I want to get onto a pole. I'm so excited to get like those big massive escaletto leaves. I didn't actually know that the texture of these would be so nice. If I were to compare it to like 
an Adansonia. I would say this is a little bit thicker, a little bit more buttery in texture. I am really crap at growing Monstera, but so far this has been okay for me. So I, I will get it a pull. I'm gonna keep it in this like same pond substrate. Sorry for all the glare, but this is um, my usual substrate of uh, Lechuza Pond, Perlite, and Orchiata. So we'll do that first and then we'll get on to the coffee questions after. All right, so looking at the roots, it's not like root bound yet. And I think I can keep it in this cup for a little while longer. It's not a cute pot by any means, but I think it's okay. You know what? I think it's okay. It's just living in my XO right now. So we're going to build the moss pole directly into the cup without unpotting this plant. I'm going to get the width first. All right, so I have the plastic piece. It's gonna be kind of invisible to the camera. And I don't know if I want it this tall. I might just cut it a little bit. Okay, so this is, this is the length we're going with. So this is the front of the plant. The pole is gonna go back here. I'm just kind of inserting it at the back like this and curving it with the cup. Okay, so it's in and it's about down to here on the cup. And now all I have to do is curve it around the plant. I'm gonna make a fastener for it and then fill in with moss and just keep kind of repeating that as I go up. I'm gonna cut one to the length that I wanted the fasteners to be and then I'm just gonna copy paste it by um, cutting more to that same length. I think this is more than plenty long so I will just snip that and then I'll just cut more exactly the same length so I don't have to keep measuring each time. Okay, I've made four, and I will just see how long it needs to be for where I cut the slits. So basically, I'm just gonna flip this pole around. I'm gonna curve the pole how I want it to curve, and I'm gonna see where this hits. Okay, I think that's the curve that I want, so this is about how long each length overlaps. So if I just pull it around like this, this is the overlap like this. So I'm going to just cut a slit down the midway point here, about halfway here. I'm cutting with my left hand and I'm cutting it about halfway. I don't know if you can see. I cut the slit about halfway and then I'll do the same to the other side except where this slit is on the bottom, this slit will be on the top. So I have two opposing slits. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna lock in to each other like this. I don't know if you can see anything because it's like transparent. I'm actually gonna make it a tire curve right now. So I've made a notch a little bit deeper, kind of like belt holes. So we'll fasten you on the tighter setting. Yeah, there we go. I like that more. So this is a little bit more curved now. And I'm going to fill a little bit more pond just to stabilize this pole. Because where the curve is, there's a lot of gap here now, so I'm just going to fill that in. I 
Mix sausage fingers. And then you just put as many of these as you want to make the curve at the top. Like you could make the whole pole at this point if you want to, or you could just build the moss as you need it and just build it up as the plant grows. I got some freshly soaked moss here. And I'm just gonna be tucking it into the back. You get the idea. You can just keep building up and up and up. I think this is as high as I need to go right now for this plant. And the lovely thing about this design is that like when you need to move the fasteners for whatever reason, so like the next leaf on this plant will come out of the petiole of this leaf. If I need to move it up, all I have to do is just slide the fastener up as you saw me doing earlier. So it's just like, my goodness. I freaking love learning new things. So this plastic um, binding cover has come in way more handy than I expected. I will link the plastic sheets that I use um, in my description, but I think the majority of my viewers are from the States, so just click it, see what I'm talking about. And I highly recommend getting the legal size, which is 11 by 17. I think, no, eight and a half by 17, something like that. But anyway, that will give you 17 inches of length rather than the eight and a half by 11, which would only give you 11 inches of length. So you'll get a lot more. So to recap, um, curve it. The fasteners is the main thing. Get a, get a strip, cut one slit at the bottom, one slit at the top, and it just comes around and then just hooks onto each other. And then if you get it the wrong length, like I did a bunch of times and you can just cut like another notch just like belt notches and you can just adjust the length that way oh my god I freaking love this pull okay one final thing I want to say about this pull that I love is that um because it's a solid background when you go in to wet this pull with a sprayer or whatever you can just like aim it at the back and it'll just kind of glide down the the back of the plastic rather than like the mesh where it kind of just like rolls off and you kind of have to like go all the way around whereas this one will actually like keep the moss moist for a little bit longer I find and even when it dries out when I go in to spray it it's a lot easier to get everything um, moistened again because there is that sheet in the back where the, the water can just glide down rather than like escape out the side and roll down the side of the, po the pole so yeah it's gonna be the go-to one for me from now on and like when I want to dismantle it, I'll just use it for the next pole without having to do anything to it. Like there's no, oh yeah, freaking genius. So um, if you haven't watched it already, go and watch Charmaine's Lazy Pole Part 1 and Part 2 video to kind of see how this idea has evolved. And I highly recommend getting a pack of these plastic sheets because they come in so handy for me. It comes in a pack of like a hundred, at least like mine did. So share it with friends but I will say that because it's come in so handy for other uses I feel like I'm gonna have to buy it again like kind of soon
Okay, so that's the poll part done. Now we're gonna move on to the Q&A. I'm gonna get another plant onto a poll, I think. I think I'll do a poll. Yeah, I wanna do a poll for this. This is my philodendron serpents. I love this plant so much and it's like really needing a repot. There's tons of roots in this moss. Sorry for the glare. There's tons of roots everywhere and it's definitely needs the substrate built up because it's like really wobbly in this and I think it deserves a better situation than what I'm giving it. So I'm going to get this out of moss. I think I want to get it into my pond mix as well because a lot of my philodendrons are doing really great in that. And then I'm going to get it into this pot here, which is quite a bit of an upgrade to this one, but there's a lot of roots and the pole will take up some space as well. So I think it's going to be fine. Yeah, I think you can handle it. There's a lot of aeration in that substrate too. So before I get started on the questions, I just wanted to kind of just give a little bit of a background on, on like why I'm talking about coffee in the first place. So I started working in coffee when I was in university and I was 20 years old at the time. I'm 34 now, so you do the math. So I took that job or like I, it was like, it was a part-time job for when I was in university just to kind of make some extra money. Um, but the idea wasn't to stay there for very long. This was early on in 2008. And um, this was kind of like at the time before specialty coffee became like a really big thing. By the way, I'm not going to say who I work for or who I worked for. I just don't think it's super necessary. Um, so I'm not going to use like any like company names here. Not that I'm like saying anything bad about the companies I work for, but just, I don't know. I don't feel like the need to um, share that information. I don't know. Anyway, so I started working in this company and it was one of the first big specialty coffee shops in Vancouver. And just to kind of like explain what I mean when I say specialty coffee, um, I mean it is coffee that is sourced from farms that also grow specialty coffee. And so like in case you didn't know, there are kind of like, if you want to generalize it to tiers of coffee and that is commodity grade coffee and specialty grade coffee. So commodity grade coffee is traded kind of like, like crops, like the prices of them would fluctuate similar to the stock market. And the coffee price is called the C market price. And that's uh, notoriously very volatile. And essentially we're like talking about like Wall Street can controlling the prices of coffee um, and commodity grade coffee is grown in like much larger quantities than uh, specialty grade coffee and specialty grade coffee like one of the really key differentiators is like specialty coffee is grown to preserve the inherent characteristics of the coffee um, which is the fruit of the coffee tree but also one huge differentiator is that specialty coffee is hand-picked and when you hand-pick cherries you're able to just select the ripe cherries and leave out the unripe and the um, rotten cherries so essentially you're able to isolate the fruits that are like the most well-developed um, and not fermented from rot because as you can imagine the berries of the coffee tree are not all going to ripen at the same time and when you have fruit that's ripe then obviously the seed is going to be more developed than unripe seeds and the seeds that we're talking about is the coffee bean so anyway specialty coffee is farmed with a lot more care it costs a lot more for the producers to farm this way obviously with the end goal of producing a higher quality product that costs more money to the buyer. So no one's going to be farming coffee this way if they don't know that it's going to fetch a higher price. Anyways, so specialty coffee on like the, the cafe side or the roaster side means that it is roasted to preserve the characteristics of the coffee. So coffee is famously a lot like uh, wine in that 
terroir, climate, variety of the coffees and uh, like, like like varieties of grapes play a huge part. Um, coffee is also like notoriously very difficult to farm and there are thousands, literally thousands of varieties of coffee. So understanding the coffee from the from the farm all the way to the roasting stage. Oh, my other lights just turned off. You know what? I'll leave the lights off. It's a little bit more intimate now. <laughs> so specialty coffee on this side where the coffee is being roasted and brewed means that you are roasting to preserve the inherent characteristics of the coffee. Um, so when you're roasting coffee, there's an art to obviously roasting that well. Um, but at a certain point, if you're starting to go darker and darker and darker, then you're starting to impart the cooking process onto the coffee bean. And you're not, the flavors that you're going to get out of the coffee are the roast characteristics rather than the coffee's characteristics from origin. I hope that makes sense. Like if you think about it, like a piece of toast has a toasty flavor. Um, because of like the Maillard reaction that like causes the browning of the bread when you cook it and the same thing is happening to the coffee and then on the brewing side I think that it is possible to take what was specialty coffee and make it no longer specialty by the way that you extract it poorly and so it's like it's really like every part of the supply chain plays a huge part in preserving the quality of the coffee and then retaining its status as specialty so that's my long spiel about what specialty is but like that's just a baseline definition of what I mean by specialty so when I started working in coffee it, um, this place I work for was one of the first specialty companies in Vancouver it was kind of like the one that made a name for specialty I want to say in Vancouver I'm ripping some of these roots but they're looking a little bit fried specialty coffee was kind of new at the time and I would say like it's not nearly as evolved as it is now so we didn't have all the technology we didn't have a lot of the knowledge and we didn't ha we weren't as data driven back then but it was still like very infectious and I found it really intoxicating like in a good way like I, I came into this thinking it was just gonna be like a job and then I realized that there was like so many people like who were so passionate about coffee and I was learning so much that I really stuck around for that and it became like really nerdy about it so at one point I did you know try to get like a grown-up job after I graduated from university um, but I kept um, one day a week at the coffee shop just because like you know extra income but also like I loved it so much that I didn't really want to fully step away and I lasted about a year in this um, office job before I realized I do not want to sit at a desk I don't want to have emails be like my primary vessel of work I needed to be like hands-on oh no that's a lot of roots <laughs> I needed to be more hands-on I couldn't just be sitting there and not have tangible work to do and I missed making coffee a lot so um, after about a year in this job I was a I was an event assistant for the university um, and doing like conferences and stuff it was super boring so after about a year I went back full-time to the cafe job as a barista and making like no money like I'm talking like no money I was like budgeting like crazy I couldn't afford to eat sometimes but that pay cut was kind of worth it I never like regretted leaving my office job and then eventually the company I had worked for then which was the same company that I worked for this whole time closed the location that I worked at and at simultaneously like this company was kind of like going downhill anyways like the quality was like not what it used to be there was new ownership I didn't feel like there was much of a future it was never going to kind of like uh, should I say it was never going to like modernize itself it was kind of always like stuck in the past and just resting on its laurels so I took that as a good sign to leave 
and I moved to where I currently work as a barista. So when I left that first job, I was like assistant manager and they wanted me to manage one of the places, but I turned it down and I went to this new place where I currently work as a barista. And then that was about eight years ago. And since then, it's just kind of been like a really interesting theme of like, I went there not wanting any responsibilities. I really wanted just to focus on my skills as a barista and learn as much about coffee as I could. And I kind of want to just sit back and like have a bit of a simple life for a bit. But literally like every few months, just responsibility just kept dropping into my lap. There's a really fried aerial root here I want to free and maybe chop off. But there are live roots coming out of it. What was I saying? Yeah, so like every few months they'd be like, can you do this? And I care about the operation, so I always say yes. So that turned into me supervising and then that turned into me assistant managing and then that turned into me being the manager um, within a, about a year or so year and a half and then I managed that place for almost three years and that was the role that probably really shaped me as a person um, because I it was probably the hardest job I ever had being a cafe manager um, if any of you listening have ever managed a cafe and leading a team, like even just leading a team in general, it's, it's, it's a lot, especially when you want to develop people into more than what they are and um, keep them happy and motivated and all the while still like trying to balance your love for the craft because like I, if I were just, just to like focus on managing and none of the coffee stuff I wouldn't be fulfilled so I really needed to balance like making time for my skills making time for me to be able to make coffee which is what I'm here to do in the first place and also like the business of running a cafe so I did that for like two and a half years or so and then um, my intention was to leave and start my own coffee shop obviously that never happened it still is like an interest of mine to have my own coffee shop but it's like so far it hasn't happened so I left the manager role I kind of like I trained my replacement and then they asked me to become the coffee trainer um so that's the role that I've been for the last three years or so and the role itself has changed a lot in the three years so it's been a lot more um, kind of, of a bigger role I guess like it's not just training at this point it's like a lot of other stuff um, like little project management stuff and I don't know just like you know when you've been with a company for a long time you take on like little bits here and there and it kind of just like becomes this portfolio of randomness it's, it's kind of like the situation I'm in now which is fine because I know how everything runs and it's like this is the most efficient way to do things. I don't mind having my hats in a lot of arenas. But at the end of the day, like I always say, I always felt like I was put on this earth to make coffee. <laughs> and that might sound weird, but like I really do feel the most at home making coffee. I really feel like um, I understand it and I really just kind of have an understanding of the operations that obviously was learned over time, but um, it makes me happy in a way that makes me feel that this is what I was always meant to do. And I've been able to do it for a really long time and still pay the bills. I own my own house now and like it's, I, I fully recognize I'm very, very lucky in that way. I have a desire for the industry to be a certain way that I feel that being in the position that I'm in I can I don't know maybe have some sort of say in how people see coffee and for 
the industry to continue to grow and be as good as it could be. Both the consumer and the baristas need to recognize what they're working with and that true quality is one of the only ways that we can continue to have great coffee in the future because the cost to farm coffee is always going to be a risk to the future of coffee because when that market price crashes is when we start to see a lot of volatility in in the growing side of things and without the growers we have nothing so luckily right now the sea market price has gone up a lot since 2018-19 when it dropped below a dollar do i want to rinse this oh i don't want to get up okay i'm gonna rinse this and be right back i don't think that really did much that was a very uh lackluster rinse but i think it's fine i've, I've put mossy roots into um pond before without it croaking I don't remember where I was, but one of the questions was like asking me to talk about my coffee journey. Another one was... I'm gonna try to get like a lot of the same questions into the same answer. All right, so um, yeah, just talking about my, my experience, I would say like 15 years, I've changed a lot as a person. So much has happened in my life in 15 years that I can't even like begin to quantify all the changes but the constant has always been coffee and um, my biggest takeaways I think from the last 15 years is like I think probably management skills so I would say if I could have it my way I would own my own coffee shop and Obviously I'd be managing it, but I would be, it would be like an owner operated coffee shop. And I know that's not how you make it big <laughs> and make the big monies, but it makes me so happy to be making coffee all the time. And since I became a trainer, obviously that means I became a worse barista because I'm not actively doing it anymore. So while my knowledge and my ability to teach became stronger, I am not actively doing it. So I, I do feel rusty in ways like I know, I know the theory of it and I know how to get it done. I know the how, but that doesn't mean my hands move in the way that I used to be able to move them, if that makes sense. I should have honestly put the plant in here. I'm gonna just shove the plant in because I can't be bothered. Get in there. So I have the plant kind of slotted in at the back and then I'm gonna get some mico on there before I fill it up. So yeah, if I had it my way, owner operated cafe it doesn't need to be highly lucrative or anything i just want it to be mine and at one point i really did want to do that and it the decision had to be made um between do i want to put money into a business for myself or do I want to buy real estate and I guess it's pretty obvious which, which option I went for I don't regret it but, but that is where we are at now I guess I will conclude my little recap of my 15 years experience by saying um, I don't have plans to stop working in coffee. Like I said, I tried to leave one at one point and something always brings me back because there's just something about brewing coffee for people and like the relationships that you foster with 
customers and there's just something so addicting about it and, and gratifying. I would say that like if someone was to want to work in coffee as a career long term, there's few uh, paths you can take. Um, one being cafe operations, which is what I do. Like that would include like owning a coffee shop, that would include being a barista, manager, whatever. Um, and then another one would be roasting. Another one could be sourcing. So like traveling to origin and buying coffee, working with producers. And for me, it was never even a question. It was always going to be operations because like I said, I do feel like I was, you know, put on this earth to make coffee and and um, run operations of a coffee shop. That's pretty much all I got to say about that, um, which leads me into the next question. So one question was, I really like this question. It was, um, do you have any advice for someone who's looking to get into specialty coffee and look for a job? So what my assumption is that this person is talking about looking for a job as a barista. I hope I'm not assuming wrong. So speaking as someone who has hired a lot of baristas and not all of them with experience, um, I will say that experience is not absolutely necessary, but I guess I'm just speaking on behalf of myself and not every coffee shop owner or manager is going to be this way, I guess. Maybe they have, you know, obviously everyone has different things they're looking for. But speaking just for myself, um, like some non-negotiables is at least some experience with customer service. And that's not really hard to find. Like you can kind of tie customer service into almost any job that is like, um, outward facing. You need to enjoy working with people. You need to enjoy working as a team. Um, you need to be like adaptable. You also need to have a strong curiosity for coffee. Um, and just, I think really important thing is like understanding that like, I think that to, to go far in coffee, you need to have Kind of like a respect for the industry in the sense that like mastery of coffee is not possible. There's too, too much that we don't know about coffee and too much that happens on a microscopic level that to think that you're an expert on anything is just foolish in my opinion. So yeah, I think that a strong sense of curiosity and not needing to be the best but rather than your priorities should be the desire to make the best cup of coffee that you can that i think should be the goal if you're looking to get a job as a barista somewhere at, and i'm assuming you want to you know go somewhere where you admire the company and the coffee that they either roast or serve. Um, I think that you definitely should research what they do and what their mission is, what kind of coffees they roast and serve, like what their goal is with those coffees. And I think that you really should try their coffee and not go into an interview having not tried their coffee. And by try their coffee, I mean like, you really should try their coffee as it is, either as espresso or black coffee. You need to know like what they're all about in order to know if you wanna work for them. A, you can see if that is the coffee that you enjoy. Um, and B, you can see that like, you can tell them about their own product. Like I don't go into an interview not knowing the product. Like coffee is not just coffee. Coffee 
with different roasters are all going to be very different. Um, research into like their buying practices, research into, you know, like what's important to them, what's their like kind of DNA. This is done by the way. How cute is this surface? I'm so stoked about this. I don't think it'll reach the top of the pole that quickly because the internals are really, really tightly spaced on this. So I think it'll be like a good, I don't know, four leaves before it gets to the top and it puts out maybe a leaf every three to four weeks. So that one is done. The next thing's not a repot, but I did find freaking mealy bugs on my Hoya Fuwa, Fuwa Ensis. Let me see if I can show you on this vine. I noticed because I was like checking the peduncle and like it aborted and I was like, why? And I saw all these like fuzzies on the vine near to where my finger is. So I'm gonna, while I talk about the next thing, um, just get some alcohol and kill these. What was my next thing? Oh yeah, so uh, just to kind of wrap this up, know who you're working for or look, know who, know who you're applying to work for, whether that be like a big company um, and like, you know, bigger companies are going to be busier. So know like the, the pace that you wanna go in. Um, do you wanna work for a bigger coffee company with more growth opportunities or do you wanna kind of go somewhere really um, small where you can focus on learning but also know that like the smaller the place is the more hats you'll have to wear and like look, go look for a place where the baristas look happy the baristas look engaged with what they're doing because marketing can go a really long way in coffee and you know a place that really has the reputation for being really high quality may not be that way um so like yeah go to the coffee shop that you're you're interested in working in and just kind of like watch people work like watch how engaged they are with the process of brewing a cup of coffee um maybe even like if they're not too busy even like ask some questions about the coffee and like see how um like excited they are about it that can tell you a lot about like how much you're gonna get out of it as a coffee education yeah, and if you want to go a step further, you can like get some of their coffee and brew it at home and see if that is like something you you like. If you're in a coffee shop looking to get like a better coffee education at a different company, one advice I have is like really get to know your equipment that you're currently working on that you can speak to at your next interview because I can't even tell you how many people I've interviewed that have no idea who roasted the coffee they worked with, what espresso machine they worked on, what grinder they worked on. They can't tell me any of that stuff. They're like, I made coffee, I made lattes. I want to learn latte art, but then like, okay, so you just want to learn latte art and that's it. And like, do you care about the coffee or do you care about the milk or the showmanship? If you work in coffee and you want to get better at it and you want to, um, you want to progress, you have to really not want to be a master at something, if that makes sense. So the minute that you think that you've mastered coffee is the minute you're going to stop growing. It's really easy to feel like a coffee snob once you've learned a few things, but that's only going to stop your growth. And I think that the same thing applies in plants too. Like there are so many ways to do something and you have to like understand the fundamentals in order to be able to like continue to grow and expound upon this logic. For example, you can't just like listen to how one person grows their plants and do everything that way as if that was just gospel. You have to take the time to understand the the fundamentals of why these techniques or uh, growing practices work for them and like 
how that plays into nutrients, light, um, humidity, temperature, all those things and like balancing these things. Like if I'm, if I'm gonna draw a parallel with that to coffee, there's not one way to brew coffee. There's not one way to extract coffee. Um, water is different. Equipment is different. We're always learning more and progressing the technology, although very slowly with coffee, it is happening. Like I've seen it happen over the course of the last 15 years. So um, if you wanna get better at coffee, no one's going to take your hand and make you from a beginner to someone who's very, very, very good at their job. It wasn't one person that taught me everything I knew, it was me grabbing every bit of information that I could along the way and then applying that to what I do. I feel like I went on a bit of a tangent, but that's gonna kinda lead into my next question. I think I got all the new leads on this, did I? What is this? So it's just like scabby Hoya things, I think. It's not too bad. I'm going to also apply some um, uh, bonite systemic granules. But I'm just gonna get it a little bit topped up. And I'll be fine. I've been having like a mealy problem on the shelf that this is on, which a lot of my succulents are on. We're gonna repot my green Waraquiana. She's seen better days. I don't know why she looks so pale right now and she hasn't grown for a while. It's been a few months since, uh, which is the newest leaf? I guess this is the newest leaf, yeah. And you can see the, how exposed the stem is here, so I want to get into a taller pot. Jing recently got in the, these pots, so this is the bigger pot of the one that I showed before. I can't remember which video it was. So it's a lot taller, so I think I'm going to try this one and I'll build the soil up a little bit higher and I'll still keep this little like moss mountain at the top. The next question I was going to talk about, which is kind of related to what I just talked about, which is like understanding how coffee works um, before you kind of go on and on to the next steps. So understanding how coffee works, um, yeah, no one's going to teach you everything, but if you understand some of like the basics, you can really draw lines between the dots and figure things out for yourself. So the question was, how do I, wait, let me see what, it, how is it worded? Small adjustments we can make at home for better coffee. I use AeroPress, for example. I also use AeroPress. AeroPress is a really great brewer, by the way. There's so many things you can do with it. There's so many like cool um, recipes you can look up for AeroPress. But what I wanted to talk about was like how adjustments you can make to make a better AeroPress. So one thing that um, like a lot of home brewers might not really recognize is that like owning your own grinder is so 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 important. So you can't really brew a great cup of coffee without dialing in your grinder. And by dialing in is, I mean like finding the grind setting that works for this coffee on this particular day. So certain coffees, not certain coffees, every coffee will grind differently kind of constantly all the time. And this is because different like every coffee, like if you're not buying the exact same coffee, which is from the exact same origin with the exact same varieties of coffee and by varieties, I mean like not even just a species, but the subspecies of coffee tree that it is, is going to affect how, how large, how dense the coffee beans are. Um, it's also going to affect like the roast levels different densities of coffee is going to develop different ways during the roasting process. So all these things are going to change how the coffee should be ground. And um, there's also things that affect the solubility of coffee. So like how easily, easily soluble is this coffee in water? 
Um, roast level is one big thing that affects solubility. So in general, the darker you roast, the more easily soluble the coffee is in water and the more easily you can extract from it. So owning your own grinder is absolutely imperative to like making these small tweaks to improve your brew. So another thing that will affect how you grind your coffee is age of the coffee. So after a coffee gets roasted, a ton of carbon dioxide is produced during the roasting process and that's just a byproduct of the process of roasting. It's not positively contributing to the flavor of the coffee per se, but it is there and it's, it's just what happens when coffee gets roasted. So it's going to be packed full of CO2 and that really overpowers the aromatics of the coffee and like the characteristics. It's really, really difficult to have a nice tasting coffee when it's so fresh. Like that's one huge myth with coffee is that the fresher the better. Um, it's not like produce. It's not going to go bad, but it will degas and coffee really does benefit from a resting stage. So from the day it's roasted, like it really depends on how that company is packing the coffee. I would say minimum one week age, if it's like for espresso, for example, um, if it's like a drip coffee roast, because there is more of a exposure to like the atmosphere when you're brewing drip versus espresso, which you're like enclosed in this group head chamber. You can get away with less rest time with filter, so like at least a few days, but like I would say a week would be nice. But anyway, let's say you have a well-rested coffee and it's, um, you know that this is the coffee you like, but you're not getting the best flavors out of it. How are you, how do you, um, make minor changes to make it taste better. So I think it's really useful in this instance to understand extraction and optimizing your extraction to get the best flavor. And I think um, sometimes there's too much focus on how much extraction with coffee and not enough focus with the evenness of the extraction. So if you have one dose of coffee, let's say you have 20 grams in your AeroPress and some of that 20 grams of coffee is being extracted higher than the rest of it, then you're going to have uneven extraction rates across the coffee. And if you've ever brewed coffee, then you've probably heard of over extraction and under extraction. So just to like break that down a little bit the coffee bean, the roasted coffee bean, um, roughly, let's say 30% of it is water soluble and the rest of it is like woody plant matter that can't be dissolved in water no matter what. It's just always, it's like, it's like trying to dissolve this in water. Maybe only a little bit of it will dissolve. So it's kind of like that with coffee and there's like factors that will also change that percentage, but it's never going to be 100% extractable. And even if it was, you don't want all 100% of that because some of those flavors are going to be really bitter, astringent. There are tannins in coffee that come out. So you have to also understand what does over extraction taste like and what does under extraction taste like. So over extraction is probably like, uh, I guess you, it depends on the person. So I ended up like <laughs> taking off so much of the soil from the roots because the moss comes down really far. Um, so over extraction can taste a lot like astringent because tannins do take quite a bit of extraction to, to pull out of the coffee. Um, astringency, bitterness, um, <clears throat> when this coffee might used to taste like vibrant and like complex and sweet, it suddenly will taste really hollow and, and just flat and bitter. Um, so that's not ideal. Under extraction, you haven't pulled out enough of the nice stuff out of the out of the coffee, so you'll end up having like a really like disappointingly short aftertaste. Um, you'll have 
excessive acidity that's just like kind of sharp and un unpleasant. Um, you don't get a lot of sweetness, you don't get a lot of bitterness, well you don't get barely any bitterness and the bitterness kind of does kind of round out the flavor a little bit. Like with in moderation, bitterness can really uh, kind of add a little bit of a dimension to the cup. You want, you don't want like just right extraction, right? So imagine you had an uneven extraction, then you'll have the worst of both worlds. The first thing you should do is to ensure that you have even extractions. So if you're agitating the coffee at all, do it evenly. Um, do not underestimate the power of the pre-wet, which is before you start putting the majority of your brew water onto your AeroPress, make sure that you've done the pre-wet, which is let's say if your total water was 250 grams or 250 mils, add like 50 grams or 30 grams or something enough to saturate all the coffee and water and make sure you like excavate, excavate coffee and make sure everything is already wet before you add the rest of your water. And that means that when you go in with your main brew water, everything will start extracting at the same time. It's not going to start extracting like the pre-wet coffee and if there's a dry patch of coffee in there that will be delayed in the extraction process so that is absolutely imperative to to um a good extraction where's my soil so now that you have even extraction and you have a recipe that you're happy with the amount of water but you just think that like you want to fine tune how much water or how much extraction uh, or even like the grind setting you want to use basically when you're tasting your final cup and i recommend tasting it black so you you're like tasting it without um, anything added to alter the flavors but let's say you're i'm gonna mix in some of the old soil with the new soil by the way so you're tasting the coffee and you're looking for um, you're looking for characteristics of either over and under extraction. So let's say for example, it is your your coffee is under extracted and it tastes just lackluster, a little bit grassy, or like just lacking in sweetness. It doesn't taste like how you know it can taste. Then you want to increase your extraction. So I need both my hands to, to explain this. So how to drink coffee and assess the extraction of it in a simple way. This is as simple as I can make it by still being kind of thorough. So you taste your coffee and then you think about acidity, sweetness and bitterness. Um, those three things should be present in any well roasted coffee. So that will help you to determine how far along you might have gone in the extraction. So let's say this is 0% extraction and this is 100 or 100% of what can be extracted. So obviously you don't want to be here, you want to be somewhere here. So when coffee is being extracted, acidity comes first then comes sweetness and like the complex like unique characteristics of that coffee and then bitterness will come a bit later another thing to appreciate is that the beginning part of the extraction is really really efficient so the extraction rate is super high so like the very beginning of the extraction is going to be highly concentrated it's going to be packed full of coffee solids and then the more you extract the extraction rate decreases, so the concentration of what's being pulled out of the coffee by the water is going to also decrease, so you're going to have more and more dilution the more you extract. If you cut the extraction too early, then you're going to have like a really muddy, super intense cup of coffee, which is not that great because <clears throat> you don't have enough like to stretch it out for you to be able to taste different things within the coffee and, and simultaneously um, you won't be extracting enough out of it so you're not going to have you're going to miss out on a lot of the really nice flavors so under extraction can also taste really strong 
if that makes sense. So then um, you're going from <clears throat> highly acidic and then you're extracting some sweetness and like unique uniqueness out of the coffee and then you, you're getting a little bit of bitter. So knowing how that kind of progresses can kind of tell you where are you in the extraction. So if I'm tasting like um, unripe cherry and lemon with some like kind of almost savory grassy lemongrass i'm probably under extracted so i might be over here whereas i want to push the extraction a little bit more to pull out more sweetness pull out a bit more depth and get it a little bit cleaner overall so i hope that helps like that can help you determine like which direction i should be going so one easy way to increase your extraction is just by increasing the water. So if you're brewing to, um, let's say a one to 13 ratio. So for every gram of coffee, you have 13 mils of water. Then you can increase that by like to like one to 15 or one to 16 to start with and see how that affects the flavor. That's the easiest way that doesn't affect the way you grind um, if you also want to change the grind or if like increasing the water is not an option for you because air presses are really small and there's only so much water it can hold then you might be forced to grind finer grinding finer will definitely increase your extraction as well so I think um, a really nice way to brew AeroPress at home is by brewing a concentrate and then diluting with just plain water. And I don't think that I have the energy to film a brew tutorial on top of everything. So. What I'll probably do is link a AeroPress recipe in the description and you can check it out because it's not my recipe anyways so there's not really much point in me doing the tutorial. I'm just taking scissors and really gently poking around and letting the soil fall in between the roots. I would usually use a plant tag but all the way on the other side of the room and I don't want to climb over everything. Is there anything else I wanted to add about that? I think I think that would be like a really good start is under understanding your extraction and like if you really want to improve your home brew then um, I think it's a good use of your energy to play around with your recipe every day and know that it will never stay the same like the optimal grind setting the age of your coffee will make a difference too so like don't buy so much coffee that is sitting for a really long time but also don't try to avoid brewing coffee that's way too fresh because you're just not going to have a good time with it because all that carbon dioxide in the roasted coffee is just released during the brewing process and that makes uh, it makes it really hard to extract evenly because like if you imagine when hot water touches like really gassy coffee a lot of co2 is released and it just puffs up and bubbles up and that impedes the even flow of water through the coffee so yeah um that's my spiel about improving your brew at home um if there's no one way to do it oh this is like covering my whole body there's no one way to improve your brew. It's really up to you and you can decide what you want to get out of it. Um, and don't let anyone shame you for how you prefer your coffee. But similarly, don't shame anyone for how they like their coffee. Which is funny because that kind of leads me to my next question, which is what, what drink order makes you roll your eyes or something like that. Honestly, and this is probably speaking from like, you know, a business standpoint as well, but I don't care what people order 
in the coffee shop like literally whatever makes them happy and whatever makes them enjoy their coffee is what I want them to order it doesn't matter how many pumps of syrup you ask for if I have like a really beautiful coffee in the hopper today and then you ask me to I don't know <laughs> mix it with drip coffee and like caramel and then um, diluted with some hot water I don't know there's some crazy things that people ask for if that's what it takes for you to enjoy it then go for it I will do that for you because I mentioned this in my video with Charmaine is that there's too much gatekeeping in coffee you guys it's not that deep it's coffee like coffee is important but at the end of the day, I'm on the farmer's side in that, okay, we are not, oh yeah, by the way, this is done. It's in a bigger pot. I love this pot, by the way. I'm gonna link um, Jing's shop, but she just restocked these pots. This is the large size. And that's my queen now. Hopefully, she can stretch her legs a bit and be a bit happier. There's too much gatekeeping in coffee. It's kind of like, I can draw some parallels with the plant community as well. The gatekeeping that I'm referring to in coffee like comes a lot from like men. <laughs> um, people who take, who are like kind of invested in the sourcing or the roasting process and they're like super protective of their coffee and they're like, if this person adds cream and sugar to their coffee or whatever then they don't deserve to have this like beautiful coffee and it's very like esoteric and like just kind of icky and for me it's so counterintuitive to how like to a long-term solution to like this almost crisis that we've had we, we keep having where the great farmers that are producing like amazing coffees are no longer able to do it because it's not financially viable to do it because how volatile the prices are there's climate change there are diseases that are like wiping out whole harvests like there are easier crops to farm than coffee if someone is producing amazing coffee and you're able to get it out to more people regardless of how they drink their coffee and how they take it isn't that a better thing for the future of the coffee industry like why are you being so protective of this beautiful coffee are you would you rather it sit there and then like age to death and nobody enjoy it than get it to like bob who likes it in a vanilla latte like it makes no sense to me like why why do you feel the need to protect this thing and say like you can pick and choose who deserves to have this coffee it's in the same way it's just like like elitism in plants it's like you if you don't know enough about plants you not you don't deserve to to own this plant or like shaming people for not knowing enough and saying like oh you shouldn't why do you buy rare plants if you didn't even do your research on it like it's their own money <laughs> if they had the opportunity to buy this plant, let them have the plant. It's literally none of your business. So yeah, to answer that question, I know it's not probably not the answer you were expecting, but it is true that like I have no judgment for anyone who buys coffee. I will judge people who judge people. <laughs> so um, yeah, and that's really all I got to say about that um, and I, I guess if I had to say one thing about like um, coffees that I roll my eyes at there is currently a trend right now where like there's so much natural processed coffees on the market and what I do roll my eyes at is like people who say they only want to drink naturally processed coffees and they don't want washed coffees and like I won't go into all the details of like what's washed and what's natural maybe that's a story for another day but I will roll my eyes at that because natural coffee is like where the fruit of the coffee cherry is allowed to like ferment and rot off so it provides 
a lot of like fermenty flavors to the coffee so the coffee if it's done right <clears throat> then the coffee ends up tasting like really like intensely fruity almost like overripe fruit if it's done poorly then you start to taste like compost and like vinegar kind of taste sometimes even like an alcoholy kind of taste so I hate it I don't hate it I don't hate anything in coffee but I roll my eyes at people who say like that's the way that all coffee should be and I, I highly disagree I think washed coffee it will make its comeback I hope that this whole natural process um, trend dies one day soon um, and then the other question I had kind of along these lines of like a little bit more <clears throat> industry stuff is um, so the question was is the do you think the prevalence of robusta makes people afraid of acidity I'm paraphrasing but that's I think that's what the question was and um, I don't actually think that robusta is very prevalent at all especially not I mean it's definitely not in the specialty industry so just to kind of simply recap like robusta versus arabica so the coffee plant and there's basically like two main species that are cultivated and that's one is arabica and one is robusta so you, you probably all heard commercials like they say 100% arabica coffee and then robusta is very rarely marketed because it's known to be like the lesser of the two it's more bitter um, it's higher in caffeine but um, it's also like more pest resistant, um, disease resistant, it's a hardier species but it doesn't taste as nice as Arabica, it has a lot more potential to be sweet and like vibrant and just have a lot more characteristics but it is like more less of a strong species than Robusta. So Robusta is often farmed for like, it's the big, it's mostly produced in Vietnam but it's also often farmed for like instant or like Vietnamese coffee are the two main um, uses that I can think of. So I actually don't think that Robusta is prevalent, but I do think that people are afraid of acidity and I hope that that does change because acidity is a beautiful flavor and like so imperative for balance that um, I think that, I think it is trending towards more like acceptance of acidity in coffee as like, you know, millennials start to kind of take over the market. I think we're more open to those flavors in coffee. We grew up with more of a specialty coffee kind of situation rather than like our parents might have been. They grew up in like first, second wave of coffee, you know, like they would have been maybe our age when Starbucks became a thing and then now for us like we have probably most of us would have access to a lot of like independent coffee shops with like lighter roasts of coffee so i do think that people are generally like trending towards accepting some i don't know where that cut off but i got overheated again um i'm gonna just quickly run through a few more easy questions so how do you keep your teeth so white when drinking coffee i don't um I don't know how it looks on camera, but my teeth are not that white. <sighs> Twice now I've stopped for my camera overheating and now my camera just died. So I went and sat on my bed for 20 minutes while it charged. Um, it's almost 1 a.m. now. So I'm gonna just like quickly run through some easy to answer questions. So favorite coffee shop in Vancouver slash favorite or coffee shop recommendations so i can't like recommend a coffee shop in vancouver and that sounds really bad but i genuinely don't think that there are any that like kind of blow me away that's not to say i can't enjoy a cup of coffee in vancouver but i wouldn't say like any coffee shop is really killing it right now i hope that like kind of sounds okay but one coffee shop and it's not in vancouver but this coffee shop really did blow me away and when I say that visiting this coffee shop made me want to be a better barista I'm not even exaggerating in the slightest it inspired me so much um, so this is Kelowna coffee in Bath in England 
It's owned by Maxwell Colonna Dashwood, who is a former UK barista champion. Like, my whole experience in the coffee shop, I went there twice, was just incredibly inspiring. Every single person who worked there was so engaged, so very skilled and good at their job. And even beyond that, there was this like warmth to their hospitality that just didn't really exist, I found in Britain. Like, I found that coffee shops were really like, I know that they're not paid that well in 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 um, in the UK as baristas, and also like you don't have like a tipping culture either. So it was not surprising that the service was really like cold and just kind of like transactional. But Kelowna wasn't like that at all. And then even beyond that, I had the most incredible like life-changing carrot cake I've ever had there. Also the coffee beans that I was able to take home like uh, not Kelowna, <laughs> Maxwell came in like grabbed us a cup of coffee a couple bags of coffee to like bring back and I'm not just saying this because he was so nice to us but it was truly like some of the best coffee I've had in the last 10 years it was just like you couldn't it was such a forgiving coffee you could brew it so many different ways and it would just taste different and yet so good in different ways like it was just perfect it was just perfect I couldn't even fault it one bit so Kelowna coffee in Bath including if you're able to get their coffee and get it shipped to you um, I would highly recommend it but I can't really say that I super recommend anything in Vancouver there are places that I'll go but I'm not gonna say like you have to go to this place because they're like doing great things with coffee because I don't know that that exists in Vancouver at the moment the scene is kind of like meh what kind of coffee machine you own or how do you brew your coffee or what is your favorite coffee favorite coffee black coffee preferably black batch brew I don't know if this part got cut out when my camera overheated so I'm just gonna say it again black coffee, preferably batch brewed, or if I have to, brew it myself, AeroPress or V60, but if I went to a coffee shop, I would never, not never, but I would prefer not to order a pour over, I'd rather get a, a batch brew. Um, how do I make coffee at home, AeroPress V60? Oh, um, this one's, I'm a barista and I was curious what espresso is your favorite to work with slash drink? It's hard to say like which specific coffee, but in terms of origins, my favorite espressos lately used to be, um, I like African coffees, so um, Ethiopians, but lately in the past few years, I've become really, really incredibly fond of Honduran coffee, specifically washed coffees from Santa Barbara region. How do you feel about the flavor wheel? That's an easy one. Um, I, I think it's great. So the flavor wheel, if you don't know, is a, I don't know if I'm allowed to put this up on the screen, but if I'm unsure, I'm going to pop it in the description. It's, it's a wheel made by the Specialty Coffee Association, which is like a wheel with different kind of like categories of flavors. So there's like big flavors in the middle and kind of branches out into like more specific flavors. And you use this to help you taste coffee characteristics, but also defects. I think it's I think it's awesome and it's a really nice design so I yeah I really like the flavor wheel but this person I think didn't expect they did the mm face after so I maybe I'm thinking like they think it's a pretentious thing and I think it is if it's just used purely used as like imagery um, but if for someone who's really trying to train their palate I think it's really um, useful and nice okay I'm not I'm, I'm not gonna be able to get through all these questions but yeah um, let's end with um, a really really hard-hitting tough question um, this question is from Charmaine do you like espresso or mocha <sighs> it's a really really hard choice but I think I'm gonna have to go with mochaccino all right guys that is it for today i think that is a lot of coffee talk if you haven't noticed once i get talking about coffee i'm not going to be able to stop um i hope you guys enjoyed kind of like a different kind of subject matter today let me know if you enjoyed it i do have more questions that i can answer 
and um, if this video does well maybe I'll do another one maybe I'll do one with like hands-on brewing although that would be like a little bit more difficult to film because I'm not gonna do that at work by the way I'm holding this plan because it's like 1 a.m. now and Huxley's gone to sleep so I'm holding the fuzziest thing in the room which is my serpents um if you have any other coffee questions feel free to leave it in the comments and if it's easy to answer i'll just answer it in the comments or maybe i'll save it for the next video if the next video ever happens i really don't know if this is something people would enjoy or want to see but yeah um i think that is it for today i hope you have a great weekend and oh no this is going up on tuesday i hope you have a great week the next video will be back to our regular Sunday schedule. I hope you have an awesome week and I will see you in the next one very soon on Sunday. Bye guys.